So uh, we come to the final talk of today. Uh, Bjorn Davidson. Uh, Bjorn got his PhD in uh, 2003, Sorry. right, from Uppsala University. And his interests are uh, trying to understand the early evolution of uh, uh, small solar system bodies, such as comets. Uh, so essentially, uh, it, it towards uh, this, uh, I think uh, he may not belong to either schools, but uh, may tend to one of the schools of uh, a Nice model versus uh, pebbles and planets, which seem to be converging now. Um, uh, <laughs> Are not, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, still a lot to know. Uh, so, Bjorn would actually, uh, he, he's uh, a coy on a, a Rosetta uh, Osiris uh, camera. So, he has done a lot of uh, uh, work with the surface, uh, 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 you know, geology of co uh, comet uh, CG. Uh, so, what we are going to do is that now that we have uh, seen how comets could have. Uh, evolved from uh, protoplanetary disk all the way down to, uh, to, to our solar system, about 1 AU or something like that. Uh, we end this with uh, uh, Bjorn's uh, talk uh, that how we can look at the surface and, talk, uh, un and understand, uh, again, its origins back. So we are essentially closing the circle uh, with uh, Bjorn's talk. Okay, since 2016, mm -hmm. Uh, Bjorn is uh, uh, a scientist at JPL. Okay. Thank you, Murthy. Uh, is my mic on? The sound is okay? Okay, here we go. So as uh, Murthy said, uh, I'm a co-investigator of the OSIRIS camera that uh, flew on the Rosetta orbiter. And I'm going to show you a lot of nice photographs that the camera took of the, of the surface. And, uh, uh, describe various uh, geological features that we saw on the on the comet surface. So that is basically the first part of my talk to exemplify these morphological structures and features. And then I'm going to go into trying to explain why the comet looks like this. And there are three points that I would like to make. Uh, the first one being that the comet uh, seemed to have formed as a stratified object. There is a lot of layering that go very very deep in in the, in the comet. So this is something that is related to how the comet formed. And when this stratified object is uh, eroding in the sunlight, it creates a lot of uh, strange and weird shapes. And that is what we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, the second point is that the upper few meters of the comet seems to be quite different from the interior. There is a surface skin that is quite uh, compact and strong. And it's different from the interior that seems to be much more porous and fluffy. So there is a, uh, a surface layer that has been uh, processed by, by solar light. And this is something that we call consolidated terrain. It looks almost like rock to the eye. And it's probably quite different from what is inside the, the object. The, second, uh, the third point is that this consolidated terrain seems to break up in pieces. It erodes. And these pieces are going into the coma with the gas drag. And some of them. Some of these pieces are falling back on the surface of the comets. And these form an yet another prominent type of terrain, which we call smooth terrain. It looks like sand to the ice from large distance. And these two lands form are basically dominating what we see on the surface, consolidated and smooth. And none of them may have much to do with what is happening inside the nucleus. And this we have to keep in mind when we look both at the uh, images and when we interpret the, the gases that, uh, that uh, enter into the coma. So just to put Rosetta in uh, perspective, uh, we had a lot of very nice, wonderful spacecraft mission in the past that observed comet nuclei. And this is a sample of different objects that have been observed uh, close up by, by spacecraft. Now, all these uh, spacecraft experiments were flybys. So they went by very, very quickly, uh, making observations essentially during a few hours. And uh, they came to within distance of several hundred kilometers of the object, which means that the resolution is not that high. So the thing that is special about Rosetta is that we were orbiting our comet nuclei, 67P, for two years. And we were going very close, sometimes just a few kilometers from the surface. So we got very, very detailed images, very high resolution. And we could track how the object was changing over time, over weeks, months, and even years. So this gives a a new perspective of how comets uh, look like and, and how they evolve over time. 
And by doing this, we can also place all these important observations into a context, which I think is great. So this is what we saw when we arrived. This is images from a uh, hundred kilometer distance. This was in August 2014. And to our surprise, the, the nucleus was bilobed. It consists of two big chunks. This thing that we call the large lobe, the largest di uh, diameter or, or uh, yeah, is about uh, four kilometers. And then we had a small lobe about uh, two, three kilometers across on the largest part. And they were connected by a thin neck uh, that constituted the comet nucleus. And already in this picture, you can see there is a lot of surface features, a lot of terrain uh, with the peculiar shapes. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, now I'm going to let the comet rotate a bit for you. So we will see what is behind this, uh, the, let's say, the other side of the large lobe. And then we see terrain that we call smooth terrain. This uh, big field here, which appears to the eye at least, to be, to be very, very smooth. So I think this is something that was very fascinating for us to see this large degree of variety in an object that is so small, just a few kilometers in size. So how does this come about? What is the uh, underlying processes that manage to transform such a small object to a world with a lot of different uh, terrain types? Uh, we divided the nucleus into a large number of, of uh, uh, morphological units. And we gave them cool Egyptian names. And these are after uh, ancient Egypt uh, Egyptian deities, just to be able to refer to different regions. And every once in a while, some of these names will slip out of my mouth without thinking. I will talk about the Imhotep region and the Hapi region, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're interested exactly where uh, these are, we can go back and, and look at this, this image. Uh, so let us start to talk about some of the landforms that we see. Uh, one very prominent and common type of landform that we see are cliffs. And what my colleagues have done here to the right is to calculate the gravitational field of the comet and calculate the angle between the local gravity vector and the surface normal. And that is what you see here in, in, the, in the color scale. So the blue parts are basically flat terrain. If you would put a large ball there, it will not roll anywhere. It's, it lies in a gravitationally flat terrain. However, we have regions in red uh, where the slope is uh, larger than uh, 50 uh, degrees, approaching 90 degrees. And these are very steep parts of the nucleus that we call cliffs. And they are all over the place. The biggest one is here in the Hathor cliff on the, on, on the small lobe. And there are many, many here in the uh, set and ash regions on, on the large lobe. What is the height of these cliffs? Uh, this one that you see here is about 100 meters. And it would correspond to this red thing that you see here. The half a cliff is almost a kilometer high. So these are large structures. And they look very impressive to the eyes. Uh, so yeah, what you see here is, is just one example. With uh, We have a cliff side that is about 100 meter high. And it's very common that the terrain above it and below it are, are flat. So you have like a staircase uh, terrace like, uh, like uh, landform. And this we see in, in many, many places. Now, these uh, cliffs are not static features. They are evolving over time. And we were fortunate, uh, uh, fortunate enough to see this happening before our eyes, literally. So a big piece came off in what we call the Aswan cliff. And you can see it here. It's a big white uh, feature in the middle of, of uh, a much darker uh, part of the nucleus. And it shows us two things. As I said, these cliffs are not static. They evolve. There are big pieces coming off. And they also show that the interior of the comet is quite different from what we see on the surface. It seems to be much more rich in ice. It becomes bright when we just chip off a chunk. Um, and you can see here some images that has been reconstructed from, from our actual photographs uh, showing uh, how this cliff looked like before the collapse and after the collapse. And it's quite a, a big chunk that uh, came off. It's about 80 by uh, 130 meters and uh, had a depth of about 12 meters. Um, so uh, this, this has happened in, in, in many places. Uh, but it's, uh, this is one of the biggest one and, uh, that we actually managed to you know, document before, before and after. <coughs> and when you have such a collapse, you produce a lot of boulders 
So this shows uh, the count of boulders before the collapse and the count of boulders after the collapse. And I think you can see just by eye that there are much more boulders in, in the lower image. And in fact, boulders are all over the place. That's another feature of the comet surface that is uh, quite uh, prominent. We see boulders everywhere. Some of them being several tens of meters across. This is one example here. Others are much smaller, down to the resolution limit. Uh, and we have also documented how these boulders are, are moving across the surface. We had a 30 meter sized boulder that was rolling 140 meters. And we could, dominate, uh, we could document this, uh, this transport of material on the surface of the comet. Uh, which means that sometimes we see boulders in places where we don't understand why they're there, but most likely they just, you know, jumped there or rolled or, or whatever they were doing. That makes things a little bit more complicated to interpret, but uh, this is uh, some uh, things that we often see. A big field of boulders below a cliff, showing us that this cliff collapse is happening over and over again on, on, on uh, long time scales. So we see talus cones, we see uh, boulders under cliffs. And this is uh, you know, a crack. You just sit and wait for this thing to collapse one day. Uh, sometimes these uh, cliffs uh, erode in such a way that you create an overhang. So there is a big chunk of material that just sticks out and hangs in, in the free air. And uh, eventually it will collapse. And we see this also on the nucleus, bits and pieces that simply have broken off. And they are still you know, hanging together. They don't crumble into to boulders, but they just break and fall down and sh uh, form these little roofs. And we see them on various size scales. This thing is 100 meters across, so quite large. And we see them down to, to meter scale. We can actually use this to infer the, uh, the tensile strength of the material. So we see structures on the 100 meter size scale that has, uh, that has uh, uh, collapsed. And we see features on the 10 meter size scale, and they're still standing up. So on this size scale, we have strength on the order of a few tenths of Pascal. So not very much. Another thing that we see are pits. Uh, it's not really clear how they form. Maybe they're forming in the same way as the rest of the nucleus is, uh, is eroding, or there is something else going on here, like uh, the formation of a, a sinkhole. If you have an underground you know, cavity that, uh, that suddenly collapses, uh, at least on Earth, it gives rise to these very uh, cylindrical features. And we see them also on the comet. Maybe another interpretation is that something hit here, and then it has just expanded from that point. We're not really sure. We do see, however, that they are active. So this is a typical example where we stretch the image and we can actually see dust being dragged out with the gas away from, from, this, uh, from this hole in the ground. And they are big. I mean, this is almost 200 meters across and more or less the same depth. So they are huge structures on the comet. Uh, taking a peek into the interior of these pits may reveal a little bit about how the comet looks inside. Um, I will argue later that much that we see on the surface has been processed in one way or the other. So this may be one of the few glimpses of how the nucleus actually look on the inside. And it seems to be a lot of structure here, a lot of objects that we can measure to be uh, typically two to three meters in size. And they really look like stacked oranges lying on top of each other. And we call these features goosebumps. And they may or may not be the uh, primordial building block that came together to form this, this object. Uh, as I mentioned, we have smooth terrain. This is one of the most prominent examples. It's in the Imhotep region. And uh, to the eye, you don't see much structure here. Uh, you have to go really close before you start to resolve them. I will show some, some, uh, some example of that later. And this is a very basic landform that we see in, in many, many places. Another type of landform that we see is this consolidated terrain that looks very, very different to the eye. It almost looks like rock. Uh, and um, it gives an uh, impression of being uh, quite strong. We see all these uh, bits and pieces being uh, you know, broken off. So there are many sharp corners and many you know, edgy parts of, of, of the surface. And we see cracks, a lot of cracks all over the place. And you see the size scale here. This is 75 meters. So these are cracks that run for hundreds of meters. And uh, we don't really know why we have these cracks. Many of them are probably formed by, by thermal fatigue. So you have uh, illumination that heats up the material, then it goes into shadow, it goes into night side. The, the, the temperature goes down very, very rapidly. And it basically fatigues the material to the point where it starts to crack. Uh, 
Uh, we're not sure on what size scale this mechanism is active, if it can explain also the large scale fractures or if you need some other type of mechanism like the whole object you know, flexing or, or, or moving or turning, perhaps due to build up of uh, gas pockets underneath as sort of push the whole thing up. Uh, that is something that we're still uh, talking about. What we do know, however, is that at least some part of the comet has been, uh, you know, moving on a global scale. And uh, this is an uh, example in, in the neck of the comet where we see this very prominent crack that probably is formed by having the nucleus spinning up. We can measure how the nucleus first was slowing down when it approached the sun, but at some point when the illumination conditions change, the nucleus starts to spin up and spin faster and faster. I think it increased, uh, the, the spin rate changed about 20 minutes or so. So when it spins faster, the, uh, the uh, tension between the lobes becomes stronger and they will, you know, they try to keep themselves together uh, against the centripetal force and not quite managing completely. So you start to see these cracks forming and it was actually opening up and getting longer uh, during the perihelion passage. Uh, another very prominent type of landform that we see is, is layering. We see in all over the place in, in different, uh, you know, contexts. And these are some uh, prominent example where we see layer upon layer upon layer that has been exposed. And also when you have uh, strong erosion that has sort of leveled the terrain, we start to see stratification in, in, in the cross sections. So I would like to talk about uh, this layering for a while. Uh, this was just an example of landforms that we see, but why does the comet look like this? So uh, one of the things that my colleagues have tried to do is to really understand what is the orientation and the, you, you know, how these uh, uh, layers are being oriented in space. So my colleagues have been uh, uh, basically fitting planes to a lot of these flat surfaces that you see all over the object and connect uh, flat surfaces that are, you know, visible in very different uh, parts of the, of the comet surface. And the model that they have uh, come up with is that these are really surface expressions of uh, onion-like shells. So you can imagine that there is a, a continuous shell that goes around the entire comet and uh, there is layer upon layer and then when the surface is uh, eroded, these layers become visible. And uh, one interesting feature about these uh, shells is that uh, they don't go continuously around both lobes. They are basically surrounding each lobe individually. So we think in terms of having two separate bodies, the two lobes that formed with whatever mechanism that gave rise to this, uh, to this uh, layering stratification. And then the two lobes merged in a low velocity collision to form the object that we see. Uh, and these layers, they go very deep, uh, at least 650 meters. Uh, now when we also have information on, on, the, on the southern hemisphere of the comet, we also see that they seem to go even, even deeper. So this is a, an important structural property of the, of the comet nucleus, this sort of layering. Uh, we still struggle a little bit to understand exactly how they formed. Uh, one, uh, I think, promising uh, say explanation is that it's actually having to do with how the objects form in the first place. You form comets by, you know, merging a larger number of smaller bodies and in this process they become smeared, uh, they get broken up, they, uh, you know, distribute themselves, they, they settle down in the, in the low gravity field and it's similar to models that has been proposed in the past by Mike Belton and others. Um, so some sort of memory from the accretion process itself. I think this is significant. And then when uh, this uh, layered object is being uh, eroded in the sunlight, uh, this erosion uh, is not, um, doesn't happen at a constant rate all over the place, but some layers are eroding faster than others. And it's this uh, differential erosion that creates these terraces that we see, the uh, uh, cliffs and, and flat surfaces that alternate and basically excavate this uh, stratified uh, nucleus into this uh, uh, collection of, of, of cliffs and, and terraces. Uh, 
Uh, another thing that I already mentioned was this very two different types of terrain that we see. We have the smooth terrain and the consolidated terrain. And I will try to explain how this may have formed. Uh, and one thing that I would like to mention first is that they're not just distributed randomly on, on the comet. There is a dichotomy here where most of the smooth terrain are found on the northern hemisphere. Uh, and this is the hemisphere that we saw first when we arrived, because when we arrived to the comet at large distance, this was the part of the comet that was illuminated by the sun. The south was still having polar night. So this is the first thing that we saw. Um, later in the mission, when the comet started to approach the, the sun, suddenly the southern hemisphere came into view. And here we see almost no smooth terrain at all. We only see consolidated terrain. So there's a very strong dichotomy here between the north and the south. And I will return to that point in, in, in a minute. Uh, so why do I say that uh, this uh, smooth and consolidated terrain probably is quite different from what they have inside? Well, this story started quite some time ago, about 10 years ago. Uh, me and a colleague of mine, Pedro Guitheres, uh, we tried to estimate what was the bulk density of the comet, tried to measure the mass of the comet. And the way, one way to do this is to look at what happens when the comet starts to sublimate. So you have gas rushing out into space and actually acts like a little rocket engine. You have gas going out in one direction, momentum conservation makes the comet go in the other direction. And this is strong enough to actually change the orbit of the comet. We call this non-gravitational forces. So to make a long story short, what we can do with observations is to determine the non-gravitational acceleration. What we can do with our models is to calculate how much gas is coming off and what is the force acting on the nucleus. So we get the force, uh, the non-gravitational force. And when we have both the force and the acceleration, we can get out the mass, uh, basically from Newton's second law. And the mass that we determined at that time uh, turned out to be just about 10% higher than the actual mass that was measured in situ. Now, at this time, we didn't know very well uh, the, the volume of the nucleus. Uh, we only had you know, remote observations. So the uh, bulk density that we obtained was uh, rather low, about 300 kilograms per cubic meter. The true value turned out to be a little bit higher, about 500 kilograms per cubic meter. Still, it's very, very low. Even if the comet was made 100% of water ice, it would be low. I mean, water ice, compact water ice, has a density of about 900 kilograms per cubic meter. And this is just half of that value. And uh, the fact seems to be that comets are not so rich in, in water ice that we, we maybe initially thought. They are quite rich in dust. So the uh, dust to ice mass ratio, which is still a bit under debate, but it seems to be higher than one, maybe about four. So it's dominated by silicate grain, by sulfides, by organics. And ice maybe constitute 20% or so of, of the mass of the comet. And uh, this means that the comet is very, very porous. The uh, bulk porosity is about 70% or larger. So it's very, very fluffy. Now, one thing that was troubling us already at this time, about a decade ago, was the discrepancy between the densities that we got from uh, this non-gravitational force modeling and what people got when they observed comets with radar. So this is just a list of uh, bulk densities that me and other colleagues were obtaining for various comets. And they were all pointing in the direction of something around 500 kilograms per cubic meter or lower. But then we had people observing comets with radar. And uh, you can, you know, try to infer uh, what the strength of the radar echo translates to in terms of density. And they tended to be you know, quite much higher. So uh, we started to speculate whether there was a surface process going on that would make the surface uh, more compact and uh, uh, less porous and stronger than the interior. Uh, and this seems to have been uh, confirmed, at least uh, locally, by the Rosetta mission. Uh, this is just uh, three different type of observations. Uh, and it uh, targets the dielectric constant that uh, uh, can be, through modeling, translated into to, uh, an uh, approximate porosity. So when we look at the concert instrument that was sending radio waves through the comet from the orbiter to the lander through the entire object, uh, 
uh, the uh, porosity that was inferred is around 70 percent and that is on the large scale that is hundreds of meter size scale so the entire object but again if you observe it from ground and we were fortunate enough to have the comet passing quite close to to earth here i think in 1982 and with the ground uh, based radar you can scan the upper two three meters of the object they obtained uh, you know lower porosities maybe around 60 percent and then when the people put down the lander on the surface and uh, the Philae uh, lander could uh, you know sense the uh, immediate environment where it was sitting the uh, dielectric constant and the inferred uh, porosity was even lower maybe around 40 50 percent so there seems to be uh, a surface layer that is more compact uh, than the immediate interior and it's also stronger I mentioned before that we saw these overhangs collapsing and I told you that we have strength on a few tens of pascal but if you go into the consolidated terrain and start to, to knock on the door you get you know strength of megapascals so there is something going on here at the very surface uh, this is just one uh, cut from our paper where we discussed a potential mechanism you basically devolatilize the, the upper layer you start to heat and cool the, uh, the, the surface region with the solar light and uh, you may have organics in the, in, the, um, in the surface layer that have rather high uh, melting points so they actually be start to become a little bit liquid at these temperatures and they float out and form sinternecks the thing collapses like a souffle in the oven and becomes more, more, uh, more dense and more compact and that would then uh, be responsible for the formation of the consolidated terrain. And this was based on uh, labor laboratory measurements that had been done by Norbert Kömle and his colleagues. And this is an example from their experiment chamber where they mixed a fine silicate powder with organics and then they, went, uh, they uh, uh, subjected it to a heating cycle where the material heat up and cooled down and they could measure that the, uh, the porosity was going down, the heat conductivity was going up and the uh, material sintered into some asphalt-like, you know, solid uh, uh, crust that would break and crack a uh, little bit like the cracked material that we see on the surface of the comet. So uh, the idea we have of the formation of consolidated terrain is that the, the, the material of the comet is, you know, highly porous and weakly bound by these micrometer-sized grains but that solar heating is processing the upper layer and either by, by, by uh, organics and or ice is uh, sintering and consolidating the material and create this rock-like mate material that uh, we see cracking and crumble into, into, into boulders. And that is actually the starting point also of uh, forming our smooth terrain. So uh, this uh, slide shows the, the image that we have now of the formation of, of smooth terrain. So we, we start out with the surface material that is uh, consolidated and cracked. And uh, this material cracks into little centimeter to decimeter sized blocks. And they are being ejected into the coma with gas drag. And with Osiris we could actually see these jets and we could actually resolve them. We see distinct little pieces and chunks that is coming off here, the, the nucleus. And we realized that some theoretical work that has been done in the past, for, is, for instance by, uh, by Griffo and others, showing that many of these pieces, they don't manage to leave the comet. They basically go on ballistic trajectories, so they are ejected, and then they, uh, um, the, the gases are, are expanding, so the, uh, the gas density drops down, the drag force also becomes low, and uh, some of them may return to the nucleus and rain, rain down somewhere else on the object. And they will preferentially rain down in gravitational lows where they will settle. And we think that this is the mechanism that creates our smooth terrain. So let us look at some, uh, some uh, details in this mechanism. I told you before that we had this big dichotomy between the north and the south. And uh, this, falls, uh, this can be quite nicely explained by this mechanism. So this uh, curves basically show you in black the, the distance from the sun to the comet and the red one shows the, um, the subsolar latitude and the only point I want to make is that when the comet is close to the sun uh, the subsolar latitude is far down on the southern hemisphere so basically when the comet is as, 
close as possible to the sun. It shows the southern hemisphere to the, to the sun. It is uh, violently sublimating and eroding, while the north hemisphere has polar night. So what happens is material from the south, some of it managed to find its way up on the north and it rained down there and formed these very big, uh, smooth fields of, uh, of debris that we call fallback. And uh, this is the stuff that we then see being exposed to the sun when a comet comes around and uh, is approaching perihelion. So this is the first thing we saw when we uh, went into orbit around the comet, deposits that had been formed during the previous perihelion passage. And uh, on this uh, size scale, we don't see much structure. It just looks like sand. But we were fortunate enough to have a lander that could down and, and, and take you know, high resolution pictures. And eventually, also, the orbiter itself went down on the surface to take uh, high resolution pictures. So these are examples of how this debris looked like. Uh, this is a Gilkia. This is the first bouncing of the Philae lander. This is Saiz, where the uh, entire orbiter went down at the end of mission. And the debris you see here is not really sand. It's quite large. We have decimeter, centimeter-sized chunks. And they're all very angular. This is not you know, spherical, nice pieces of material. They are quite edgy, angular, sharp corners. These are material that's been broken off from something else. At least that is a, you know, uh, interpretation. Uh, since the lander bounced and ended up in a region where we never would try to put it down if we could decide anything, we also got the chance to see the consolidated material up close. So these are images from the Rollis camera on the lander. And uh, you see the size scale here. This is 10 centimeter. And you can see how this material is, is cracked up. And uh, we believe that this is the mechanism that releases these large chunks um, of material that are then ejected into the coma. So some sort of thermal cracking that takes out big chunks of this consolidated terrain. And we saw them in flight. Uh, this is uh, images from the WAC camera. Uh, the, green, uh, the yellow arrows are pointing to stars. And then you see perhaps a little red uh, 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 speck of light here that is surrounded by a red ring. And it's moving with respect to the stars. And we were actually using this to try to fit an orbit to, to this um, to these uh, to these uh, boulders, and by fitting an orbit, we could also determine the distance, and therefore we could determine the actual size of these things. And these are decimeter-sized chunks. The largest one that we saw is about half a meter, so they are you know quite massive chunks flying around in the coma, and some of them landing again. And on their way, they seem to lose a lot of their super volatiles, and this can be seen in this image uh, that is uh, done by Uwe Fink using Virtus data. It basically shows the distribution of um, CO2 gas and water gas around the comet. So what we see is that uh, the southern hemisphere, which is the consolidated terrain that is probably you know, closer to the, to the interior uh, composition, it uh, releases quite some CO2. Uh, but these chunks that comes out from the south lose those super volatiles in the coma. And when they rain down on the northern hemisphere, they are mostly just consisting of dust and water ice. So that is why the sublimation from the north that we saw on the way in towards the sun is dominated by water vapor. And this is also something we should keep in mind when we observe comets and we observe them during a specific part of the orbit that the gas that we see coming out may not necessarily be representative of the interior composition, but it could be material that has been recycled uh, in this kind of way. Uh, just to convince you that the dust that comes down is not completely dry, it hasn't lost all of its volatiles. These are images, uh, these are actually uh, spectrophotometry made by Osiris. We can see the slope of the spectrum. And we have learned by comparing Osiris and Virtus data that when we see something blue, it means that it contains water ice. So the fact that these deposits are blue in shape means that they still contain water ice. They haven't lost all their volatiles in this journey from the south to the north. And we also see these nice holes and pits in the deposited layer that we interpret as some sort of sublimation cavities that you know, the, the material is uh, active is sublimating and, and these uh, dunes are eroding in this, in this way. Uh, so to 
summarized the formation of smooth terrain. We basically have consolidated terrain that cracks and, and, and uh, uh, breaks up in smaller pieces. They are ejected into the coma. Most of it is just floating out into space and is forming you know, the, the, the dust tail and, and, and this material that leaves the comet. Some of it is falling back, uh, mostly on the northern hemisphere. And then they accumulate on the surface as smooth terrain. And uh, I think I have maybe a couple of minutes left. Uh, I will just show you some images that also these smooth terrains are not static. We saw changes in them. We saw uh, depressions forming that was uh, expanding uh, maybe one meter deep or so. And they were expanding almost like rings on water, you know. And, and this was quite fast. I mean, they grew about a meter per day or several meters per day. Uh, often starting at the corner uh, in this uh, smooth uh, you know, terrain and expanding, merging, and, and doing all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, this is one example, completely smooth in August 14. By January 15, we had this elaborated structure, and then in June 16, back to smooth again. So this comes and goes. Uh, this is a growth of, a, of an escarpment that's propagated over the surface. Um, this is a funny thing, uh, something that at least looks like a dune field. We don't know really how it forms or why it looks like this. Uh, we observed this really early on in the mission, and when we approached the, the perihelion, we could see that it, uh, it um, disappeared. Uh, there were these uh, circular features that was growing in size and merging, completely wiping out the, the dunes. And then uh, after the perihelion passage, the dunes reform, and then they're there again. So these are things that we struggle to, to understand. So I think I'm out of time. I just put up my summer slide, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.